Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our XCOM Enemy Within Iron Man Impossible walkthrough. Before we begin today's episode, however, I have some bad news. As some of you may have seen in the post I made on Friday, I had some major issues loading the save file for this playthrough. Every time I tried to load the save that I made after the last episode, the game spent several minutes in the loading screen and then froze. All I was left with to do at this point was to close the game, leaving me unable to access the save file. I then spent most of my Friday afternoon looking for a solution online, but unfortunately to no avail. The save file remained unloadable, and since this is an Iron Man playthrough, I also don't have a ton of other files to go back to. Now, luckily, I usually create backup copies of my save files after every other episode, because the risk of losing an entire series to a technical error like this is just too high. Unfortunately though, I forgot to do that for the last few episodes, and so the latest backup copy I have is of the save I made after episode 5. Still, very much to my relief, I was able to load that one without issues. Now as you can see though, we are pretty much exactly at the same point in the game where I ended the last episode, so here is what I had to do to get back to that point. Over the last two days I had to manually replay all four missions we completed in episodes 6, 7, 8 and 9. Whenever possible I used my own videos of those missions as a guide and luckily for the most part the aliens appeared in pretty much the same types and numbers, however on different maps apart from the port end mission. One mission did have 6 thin men instead of 6 floaters, which was actually a bit more challenging, but in the end everyone survived and we now simply have a few more thin man corpses. But this should not change our overall strategy too much, as both types of corpses are worth the same amount of money. Now there is one slightly bigger change though, and that is the fact that the abduction mission we completed in episode 6 no longer took place in Japan. Yes, Japan was still one of the three countries to choose from, but the 200 credit reward we originally picked for that mission was now instead available in Russia. XCOM randomizes these things and since I wanted to keep everything as close to the original as possible, I therefore went to Russia and completed the mission there. For this reason, as you can see here, panic levels now look a tiny bit differently, but other than that everything is still pretty much the same. After all four missions had been completed, I even went ahead and used a safe game editor to give everyone the exact same number of kills as before, which means Heavy Andrea is still our kill leader, followed by Adam and Resilius. That editor was unfortunately fairly limited in function though, so it was not possible to edit panic levels or stuff like that. For the most part, however, that was also not necessary, as everyone still received the same promotions with the same new abilities and I also followed the same build order and bought the same items, and so for all intents and purposes you can act as if nothing happened and the last abduction mission simply took place in Russia instead of Japan. So my apologies for all of this, I know it's not my fault that the save file got messed up, but had I made a backup save after one of the newer episodes, I might have been able to spare both you guys and myself a lot of trouble. It is what it is though, I have definitely learned from this, and I would say let's leave this in the past and look ahead. We have only two days left until we finish construction of the officer training school, so let's finally jump into the episode and start scanning again. Officer training school online. And here we are, the officer training school has been built and we now have access to a few very handy upgrades. We can find this facility in the barracks tab and the first upgrade we will purchase is squad size 1. As the name suggests, this increases our squad size from 4 to 5 soldiers, it also voids the army of 4 achievement, but as I mentioned in episode 1, that was the plan all along. It also costs us 50 credits, but after the last mission we can handily afford that. As a matter of fact, we can also easily afford the squad size 2 upgrade, which will increase the number of soldiers to 6, and I don't think I have to mention how useful this will be. Yes, both upgrades cost us a decent amount of money now, but the investment will pay off soon. One of the next missions has the potential to be a playthrough killer, but with 6 instead of 4 soldiers, our chances for success definitely increase substantially. And that's all we do for the moment, coming up next we probably have the completion of our next research project. And indeed here we are, we have now researched alien materials. 
As a result, our science team has developed the Nanofiber Vest, a protective armor vest that can be equipped in the item slot just like a grenade or the scope. Once equipped, it grants two extra hit points of protection, but this vest was actually not what we were after. Because completing this research has also given us access to the Carapace Armor Project. And this will give us access to a much better suit of armor. However, as you can see, it also takes a while to be researched. For that reason, we will quickly spend four days researching meld recombination first, allowing our researchers to investigate the mysterious meld material a bit further, which will then unlock a few very interesting new possibilities. I appreciate your efforts to support the research team, Commander. I've already put the new recruits to work in the lab. With the project underway, we can now start scanning again. However, we want to be careful here, it is already the 15th of April, and on the 16th we will finish our two excavations, and we don't want to skip too far ahead, otherwise we won't be able to build the next satellite uplink in time. Excavation complete. And here we are, after some careful clicking, both excavations are complete, and it's still the 16th. That means we can now head over to engineering and build our next facility, and for 100 credits this will be our third satellite uplink. Because it will be constructed adjacent to another uplink, this one will increase our satellite capacity by 3, so once it is constructed at the end of the month we can launch 3 new satellites. The excavated spot on the right will remain empty for now, and we will also not excavate any further simply because we are a bit short on cash at the moment. So we have nothing else to do, let us once again continue scanning. So, what is it, Doctor? It's... remarkable. The crystalline structure housed within the canister is actually a suspension containing billions of cybernetic nanomachines, each made up of both organic and mechanical components. My team's analysis indicates these microscopic robots are capable of assembling mechanical structures with unprecedented efficiency. With further study and some specialized facilities, we may be able to engineer a sort of cyber suit that interfaces with the human body. My team is more interested in the possibility of physically altering the tissue itself, incorporating aspects of the alien's own genetic adaptations by using the nanites to fuse the foreign material. The commander will have to decide where the greatest advantage lies. Is there anything you agree on? Given the apparent purpose of the nanites, they allow combining organic materials with one another, or with machines. We have at least agreed to call them... Meld. Alright, here we are, Meld Recombination has been researched. And this short research project actually has quite the impact. As you can see here on the left, we have just unlocked a ton of new things. For example, we can now construct two new facilities, the Cybernetics Lab, where we can build the so-called Mech Troopers, basically soldiers in heavy robotic suits of armor, and the Genetics Lab, where we can genetically modify our soldiers. We can also see here some of the modifications that we have access to. The adaptive bone marrow improves health regeneration, the depth perception upgrade gives an aim bonus, and hyperreactive pupils do as well. As you can see here, we also unlock the first type of mech trooper, and I will explain all of these things in a bit more detail in due time. Researching melt recombination does not unlock any new research projects, so we can now continue to focus on a bit more protection for our squad, so let us start the lengthy process of researching carapace armor. Before we continue scanning, we can then quickly head over to the Grey Market, where we are going to sell three Thin Man corpses to get our total funds above 50 credits. Because 50 credits, that is all we need to build our next facility, and yes, it is one of the two that we just unlocked, namely the Cybernetics Lab. In this lab, which by the way counts as a workshop for adjacency bonuses, we can convert any soldier who has received at least one promotion into a mech trooper. This process is irreversible and costs us meld, however, in the right situations, mech troopers can be incredibly powerful. We have just enough power to get this one constructed, the whole process will take 10 days, after which we can then finally build our very first mech trooper. 
for the time being though, it is once again time to start scanning. Alright, we receive a council request and this one is pretty much free money. However, at the moment we don't have enough cash to complete the request, but with a 20 day window we can simply continue scanning until we do return. Commander, there's a priority one transmission coming in from the council. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, it is finally time for our next mission, and this one is the first of the Operation Slingshot DLC. Friends in Low Places has us make contact with a member of the Triads, who is apparently in the possession of a piece of unique technology. The reward for this mission is also substantial. Not only would we receive a big 200 credit cash bonus, but also two scientists and two engineers. So let's jump into things, and for the first time with a full squad of six soldiers. Excellent. We look forward to seeing your progress. And here you can see it joining our four person core of Adam, Emilia, Rosilis, and Andrea is Sergeant George Teasdale, a sniper who we received as a reward for an earlier mission, as well as rookie Nicholas Mahoney. And while it would be an option, we won't purchase any additional laser weapons for this mission. It is not the most difficult mission and our squad size should be enough to ensure success. <laughs> you must be my contacts. No one who fears reprisal would make an entrance like that. Not so different from killing a man. It won't take long for them to realize I'm missing. Especially since I've got this thing with me. If you take me with you, it's all yours. That's our man. And it looks like he's got the package with him. We'll need to get him back to the extraction point in one piece. His former employers, not to mention the invaders, will be looking for him. New objective received. Alright, here we are with quite the crowded battlefield already, in what is pretty much a target escort mission, however minus the whole finding the VIP business. So as we advance towards the extraction zone, our strategy will be fairly straightforward. We will use the surroundings of this graveyard map to our advantage as best as we can, and since the majority of enemies on this map will drop in on us from above, we will heavily use Overwatch. I'm not sure where my boss got this thing, but he was taking offers from a variety of bidders, regardless of their intentions. With everyone in cover and the VIP well protected, we can then activate Overwatch. We now have a very good overview of the battlefield and should be ready for whatever the aliens have in store for us. Eyes peeled, Strike One. Opposition is headed towards you. Repeat, hostiles approaching your position. And here we are, the first Thin Man drops in and number two follows suit just a few seconds later. However, that first one triggers reaction shots from our entire squad. Most of them, though, don't find their target. It is then sniper George Teasdale who lands the killing blow, granting him the first kill of his hopefully lengthy career. In its current position, the second Thin Man is then being flanked by Emilia, so we don't have to move at all to take a high percentage shot. And here we are, that's the first group of enemies defeated, so Rosilius can switch back to his sniper rifle and go on overwatch again, while Adam and Andrea move up to cover a bit more ground and then also go on overwatch. Sniper George also immediately goes on overwatch, he could move and still do that, but the snapshot ability would give him an aim penalty. The job itself seemed trivial, delivering equipment to a predetermined drop point. Rookie Mahoney then also moves up a bit and so does the VIP, and it doesn't take long until we have more enemies incoming. Hostiles are headed your way, strike one. Prep for contact. Once again we have Thin Man dropping in and once again it's two of them, but they should not give us too much trouble. The first one again triggers reaction shots from everyone but Emilia, and just like before it takes a well-placed hit from Mr. Teasdale to get the kill. Unlike last time though, we probably have to move to kill the second Thin Man, and because of his lightning reflexes ability, we'll do that with our Assault Adam work. Once he's in position, he can then shoot twice, that should be enough to get the kill. 
and here we are, another group of enemies is defeated. To avoid running out of ammo on the next turn, we will now reload Andreas LMG, while Sniper Teasdale slowly starts moving over to the right and then goes on overwatch. Our rookie then moves into much needed full cover and also overwatches. Once I saw this device, I began to fear the implications of our involvement. Our VIP then stays right where he is and keeps his head down, while Emilia and Resilia start exploring the left flank. It would be problematic if we had aliens drop in there who could then flank our units in the middle, so it might make sense to take a position there ourselves. On this turn though, no new aliens appear, so Emilia and Resilius can proceed, and as usual, we will keep them both on Overwatch. Resilius' battle scanner, by the way, is not all that useful in this mission, as once again, most of the enemies are not currently present. Adam, meanwhile, can move a bit closer to the center of the graveyard and reload his shotgun, while Heavy Andrea goes into full cover on the other side. Sniper Teasdale goes into full cover next to Rookie Mahoney and goes on Overwatch, while Nicholas himself reloads his assault rifle. many lines during my life, but now we all face a common enemy. Hostiles are closing on your position, Strike One. Eyes open, people. On this turn, we then once again have enemies dropping in, although I don't think they are triggered by the VIP's movement in this mission. One thin man drops in the southern left corner right behind Emilia and Resilius, while the other one goes on overwatch to the left of Adam and Andrea. Fortunately enough, reaction shots from Solberg and Walgal are enough to take the first enemy out, but Heavy Cook is too far away to land a hit and the alien is still standing. Luckily though, Adam has his running gun ability back, so we can once again safely dash over to get into a flanking position. The lightning reflexes prevent him from being hit, but on his way over he actually uncovers another nest of aliens, as two more thin men have now been revealed. They immediately run into cover, but can't go on overwatch on this turn. But first things first, we still have another thin man to kill. Wonderful, that is another kill for our assault Adam work, while the other two thin men actually present an excellent opportunity to get rookie Nicholas Mahoney his first two kills. For this purpose, we will have Heavy Andrea Cook fire a Shredder rocket at them for 4 guaranteed points of damage, and since the aliens are not on Overwatch, we can safely move Mahoney up into range to throw a grenade for the kill. Lovely, double kill for the rookie, this should ensure his promotion after the mission, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. To wrap up the turn, we can once again move up with Emilia and Rosilius on the left flank. Rosilius, however, will dash to cover some ground and get into full cover. Sniper Teasdale will also move up and into the next full cover, where he can then reload his sniper rifle while the VIP stays right where he is and keeps his head down. With no new enemies coming in, Emilia and Rosilius now slowly start abandoning the left flank. Both can get themselves a bit closer to the extraction zone and into full cover. Adam meanwhile runs back to the center of the map but does not dash and instead goes on pistol overwatch, while heavy Andrea Cook inches closer to the extraction zone. Sniper George then dashes to get into a good position in the middle of the map, a position that also gives him a slight height advantage. Rookie Nicholas then stays close to him and also dashes on this turn, and both of them now have an excellent view of the extraction zone. Heads up, Commander. We've got an intermittent contact. It's something different from the others. Alright, right in front of the extraction zone, we now have a brand new type of enemy dropping in. This right here is the Muton. As you can see, they are very tough to take down with a total of 10 hit points, so even if Andrea's reaction shot would have landed, it would probably not have been enough to get the kill. It is a different story for the Thin Man that also dropped, however, because after a well-placed reaction shot from Amelia, this one immediately vanishes from the battlefield. The Mutant now stands tall with its 10 hit points, and just like the Thin Man before, it has also gone on Overwatch. Its aim, by the way, is even higher than that of a Thin Man, so we want to avoid a shootout at all costs. Luckily though, we should be able to do that, because Heavy Andrea still has a rocket left, and 6 guaranteed points of damage should definitely be able to help us out in this case. 
The Muton then uses its Intimidate ability, which can occasionally cause panic in our ranks. On this turn, however, it doesn't, so we can safely activate Sniper Teasdale's Headshot ability and see if he can't land the kill. And there we go, our very first Muton of this playthrough is defeated, but trust me, it will not always be this easy. With no more enemies in sight, we can try to get everyone a bit closer to the extraction zone, but keep them in full cover. And as always, we will activate Overwatch on as many of our soldiers as we can. Since we're nearing the end of the mission, the VIP can also move up a bit, but he won't dash just yet, and instead stay in full cover and keep his head down for maximum protection. It's about to heat up over there, Strike One. X-rays are making their way to your position. One more group of enemies then drops in, this time consisting of a Thin Man and a Sectoid. However, thanks to multiple reaction shots, at least the Thin Man does not survive for long. The Sectoid has also gone on Overwatch, so before we do anything else, we want to remove that. And as always, the best bet for that is Adam with a combination of run and gun and lightning reflexes. He is now in a position where he can take two 56% shots in a row with rapid fire. Not the best chances in the world, but let's see what he can do. Alright, I did not expect that. The first shot is already enough to kill the sectoid. And with that, we have actually successfully defeated the last remaining enemy the game had waiting for us in this mission. So here we are, two turns later, with the VIP safely heading into the extraction zone. I am alive. But the life I had is gone now. Funny, that my life should take such an unexpected path. Turning my back on old friends to defeat a common enemy. The device and our contact are secure. Get back to HQ for debriefing. And that completes Friends in Low Places. As I said, not the most challenging mission if you have six soldiers available to you. And completing it actually also unlocks the new friend achievement. An exemplary performance. Let's hope all of these operations go as smoothly as this one did. Back in the base, as expected, we have a promotion waiting for rookie Nicholas Mahoney, who has randomly been assigned the support class. As a squaddy in the support class, he now has access to the smoke grenade, and that is also all we can do with him for the moment. Because this was our third council mission, we now receive the Council Medal of Honor, which we will of course rename after a patron from the naming rights tier in just a moment. As always, we also obtain a few corpses and materials, including our very first Muton corpse. At least for the time being, though, there is not much we can do with it. In the mission debrief, we then learn that the piece of technology we obtain from this mission is in fact a genuine alien device, although for the moment we have no idea what it does. We will be in touch, Commander. Next to the promised mission rewards, we also receive some surprisingly good news. Shoji Jang, I believe that's how he's pronounced, the VIP we just rescued, has decided to join the XCOM project as a soldier. In the barracks we can see him, he is now a lieutenant in the heavy class. I have already color-coded him appropriately in green. And looking on the right side of the screen, he actually has some slightly increased stats compared to what a heavy class lieutenant should have at this point in the game. Especially because of his high aim, we won't turn him into the classic anti-tank rocketeer soldier and instead make him a bit more of an LMG using suppression heavy. And for that reason, we will pick all three options on the right here, which all go very nicely hand in hand. First up, we give him Holo Targeting, which gives all of our soldiers a plus 10 aim bonus to any enemy he shoots at, and that also works with Suppression, which will be the next ability we pick. Zhang is now able to pin down targets and impose a big minus 30 aim penalty on them, and especially against some of the tougher enemies that will start showing up over the next few weeks, this is very useful. But we're not done yet, our next ability is Rapid Reaction, which makes him even deadlier when he's on Overwatch, as it grants him a second reaction shot in case the first one hits. His slightly increased aim makes Overwatch hits a bit more likely from the get-go, so he is indeed very well suited for this build. And that is all we can do here in the barracks for the moment. I have actually decided to do the whole metal thing next episode, but in the meantime I have at least given our new support Nicholas Mahoney a new uniform. 
Before we wrap things up for today, we can now quickly take care of the council request we received prior to this mission. So let's head into engineering and purchase two scopes. The new engineers arrived this morning, Commander. We're always glad to have more help down here. Because we received additional engineers as a reward for this mission, prices have dropped once again, so we can now purchase scopes for 11 credits apiece. Fulfilling this request therefore basically gifts us 35 credits, in my opinion a very positive end to today's slightly troubled episode. Once again though, I promise I will make a backup copy of the save file after every episode and I have also done a fresh reinstall of the game, so hopefully things like this will never happen again in the future. For today, I think we can make the cut right here. As always, I hope you enjoyed the episode and if you did, then I would be happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And if you want to support me and my channel further, then go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. Alternatively, you can of course also check out and maybe pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.